Welcome to 2819. I'm Sandra Dimas. And I'm Brian Rollenbacher. And we have a really fun show for you today. Get your thinking caps on. That's right. I'm really excited for Culture Talk today. Sandra's going to be speaking with biochemist Fuzzle Rana on the Disney Plus show WandaVision, which I was iffy about at first, yeah. but like I totally love the show now. And they'll be talking about how does that show connect with the transhumanist movement? It does. I promise. Bear with us in that conversation. Also, in Give and Take, Jeff Swearing will be talking with astronomer Hugh Ross about how flying beetles point to a designer. He's not talking about John Paul George and Ringo. I wish he were, but yeah, maybe about... for the next time we'll talk about yeah. that. <laughs> First up is RTB 101. Crystal will be speaking with philosopher and theologian Ken Samples about original sin and the human condition. Let's check it out. Now it's time for RTB 101, where we discuss practical questions to equip you to share your faith more effectively. And here to help me talk about a very important topic is theologian Kenneth Samples. Welcome, Ken. Hi, Krista. I'm looking forward to this because uh, in talking about our topic today, which is the topic of sin, Mm -hmm. it is, I think, a topic that all of us should be able to relate to. It's yeah. it's a, a universal human problem. Maybe you can walk us through kind of an overview of a biblical view of sin. What are some basic points that the Bible teaches us about sin? Yeah, very relevant, practical topic. Sin, the Greek word in the New Testament, harmartia. Krista, I think a good definition of sin is that Sin is anything contrary to the holy character of God. That holy character is often expressed through commandments. So the Bible says that sinners are commandment breakers. Uh, It also says that we have missed the mark of God. And because of that, uh, we are fallen sinners. We have uh, uh, Adam's sin nature has been passed down to all of us. That's very strongly affirmed in the Western church. Eastern Church a little bit less, but we're all sinners, and sin has disordered our lives, and we are in need of God's grace and forgiveness. We certainly are. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, sin is an interesting thing because it really impacts our lives in very practical ways every day, even when we're not totally aware of it. Um, but maybe we should talk a little bit about what some of those impacts are. How, how do we see that show up in our lives? Yeah, uh, well, first and foremost, it alienates us from God, we're separated from God, but it also alienates us from each other uh, and from ourselves. And ultimately what happens is our life is disordered and uh, Oftentimes, we start seeking other things as a uh, God replacement. Mm. Uh, And so sin has a way of disordering all of our relationships, and especially with the Lord. When I look out in the world, I see sin, and I think it's a helpful concept because it explains the world as it really is. Like, we, I feel like we know intuitively that something is deeply and profoundly gone wrong in the world. And sin can be a a helpful tool to explain that reality. What what are your thoughts about that? Well, that's a great point. I'm really glad you raised that. It's it's not just our own personal sin, but when we look at the world, there there is a breakdown in the world, a moral breakdown. We look that all human beings, we all have character flaws, even our heroes, our people with feet of clay. And uh, sometimes, you know, others recognize it as well. They talk about the problem of evil, pain, suffering. And so the world is not like it was originally created to be. I think that's such an important point, because when when we think about, you know, because there's a lot of competing explanations for what we see in the world. And, And one of the unique features of our view of the world is that God created the world good. He created it very good, but then humans fell into sin and something went dreadfully wrong. And I think that when I look out in the world and I see the amount of wickedness in the world, sin 
helps me make sense of it, that this is not the ideal. This is, this is not the way that it's supposed to be. But then when I talk to people from other worldviews, sometimes they have a differing view of what's wrong with the world, what our fundamental problem is. Um, how would you compare that to the Christian view of sin? Yeah, an important topic. Uh, you know, think of Islam, the, the Middle Eastern religion that has maybe 1.8 billion people, a uh, major competitor to Christianity. They don't accept original sin. They believe people are born good. And therefore, Islam is not a redemptive religion. You're not sinful who need to be saved. You've forgotten God, and therefore you need devotion and obedience to God. You can look at other worldviews like Hinduism, and again, you have differing ideas about the human condition, the human identity. And I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, again, to reference Blaise Pascal, Pascal said the human condition is greatness and wretchedness, the greatness because of the Imago Dei, we're exceptional creatures, yet wretched because we're fallen. And I think that has enormous explanatory power. And also it, 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 it comforts me in the sense that it's okay to feel like I'm never going to be fully happy and satisfied in this life. That's something reserved for when I get to see God uh, in what Christians call the beatific vision. I remember once uh, hearing you say something like, um, you know, in the Christian worldview, it helps us explain both the beauty and the wretchedness of humanity, that we're capable of creating amazing beauty like Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci, and then also explaining the reality and the wickedness of millions who have died uh, through 20th century catastrophes like Hitler and Stalin. And, and the Christian worldview is robust enough that it explains all of that reality. And I think that's so important because we want to have a worldview that can explain the beauty and the wretchedness. I think the more realistic our anthropology is, the more reason we have to believe it's correct. And I think even with naturalistic evolution, Krista, I think humans are both greater and worse than evolution would suggest. And the closer we are to reality, the closer we are to truth. That's so good. I, I mean, I can think of even another competing uh, view of sin right now that is out in our culture that says, well, sin is all about external systems. And mm -hmm. if we can just fix these systems of oppression, then that will solve humanity's fundamental problem. But from the Christian worldview, we would say no, because sin starts with the, the individual human. And then, yeah, humans can collude in wickedness and create mm -hmm. wicked systems, but fixing these si systems won't help our sin problem. Would you say yeah. that's true? I think that's right on the money. The fundamental problem is, uh, is a flaw at the core of our being. It, it isn't matter of society or uh, ideas concerning individual justice. It has to do with the deep-seated sin problem. Yeah. And we need a solution that can start with the wicked human heart and transform us. And I'm so grateful every day for the gospel that really invades our lives and, and um, you know, can transform our hearts into something new. Uh, yeah. It's, and that's really what we need. That is truly the only antidote to our sin problem. I think. I, I was talking with a Muslim on social media recently. I said, you know, uh, you have a prophet Muhammad, but what you need is a savior, mm. Jesus. That's so good. Well, I want to encourage everyone to go check out Ken's blog, Reflections. You can find that at reasons.org. Welcome to Culture Talk, where we talk about culturally relevant topics that you can use to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined today with biochemist Fuzzle Rana. And we're going to be talking about WandaVision. Thank you for joining us, Fuzz. 
Sandra, thanks for having me. So before we dive in, a quick recap for those who are unfamiliar. WandaVision is a show on Disney Plus and it centers on the Marvel characters Wanda Maximoff and Vision. And it's set in an alternate reality in which Vision isn't dead. So our viewers might be wondering, how does this relate to the Christian faith? Bear with us. I promise it does. Um, first, before we dive in, Fuzz, can you explain who or what Vision is? Yeah, and in interest of full disclosure, I've not watched WandaVision yet. That's <laughs> on my to-do list. I want to wait for all the episodes to, to be released so I can binge watch it. But I am familiar with the character Vision, with the character Scarlet Witch, and some of the comic book story arcs that actually inspired WandaVision. And and in short, Vision, I think most people are aware, is an android that is also an artificial intelligence system. And so in many respects, you could think of Vision as being kind of an archetype of sorts for what, uh, feel, what philosophers and, and scientists would refer to as a post-human future. Yeah, so then when we, when we think of Vision as representing a post-human future, how then do we connect that to scientific endeavors, like real scientific endeavors that are going on right now? What does that look like? Yeah, well, there's, a, yeah, of course, a lot of interest in developing artificial intelligence systems, but uh, there's also a movement known as transhumanism where people that are in that movement argue that really science and technology is going to be the way in which we ultimately alleviate pain and suffering in the world and uh, uh, usher us in as humanity into a utopian type of future. And they, their vision is that we really should be using science and technology as a way to modify uh, our biological makeups to enhance our capabilities beyond our natural limits, our, our strength, our intelligence, our psychological well-being. And in fact, they argue that our flaws as human beings and our biological limits actually are producing human pain and suffering. And so if we can correct that, we can actually, again, usher in a utopian future. Many people that hold to transhumanism even argue that this is a pathway to attain a type of immortality. And so many people that are transhumanists envision a post-human future where we have altered ourselves with technology to such a degree that we wouldn't even recognize our, ourselves anymore as being human beings. But as part of that, they also see artificial intelligence systems as being uh, one of those post-human type of species where there would be a, a collection of different post-humans that exist. Again, AI systems being one of them. And of course, they argue that, hey, these types of systems ought to have the same kind of rights as we would have as well. And so Vision is an interesting character because he is not only sentient and conscious and self-aware and autonomous, but he's also able to enter into this love relationship with uh, Wanda Maximoff. Um, how do we start to have conversations about our faith? Like, how does it even connect? Uh, how is this technology relevant to conversations about our faith? Yeah, well, you know, what? I, what's interesting to me is that when it comes to a future with potential AIs that, that might be quote unquote self-aware or sentient, um, there's really two ways that people conceive these AI systems. One is like vision in which he's a heroic benign figure. And the other is like an, an Ultron where it's an AI system that could actually harm us as human beings. And in fact, there's a number of scholars like Elon Musk who are concerned that uh, these AI systems actually could rule over us eventually if they surpass our capabilities. They could rule over us being kind of like overlords or even drive humanity to extinction. And so interestingly enough, uh, people like Elon Musk have uh, argued that we need to develop what they call neural implants or brain computer interfaces that allow us to actually uh, interface our brains, our minds with computer systems to augment our intelligence. So Elon Musk has formed a company called Neuralink uh, that is developing these neural implants where the ultimate motivation 
is really a transhumanist motivation where he wants to, to alter humanity in order to save humanity from the existential threat of AI systems. Um, there's a lot definitely to unpack with this topic. And I know that you've written, first of all, you've written a book, Humans 2.0, which I think does a really great job of giving all of the information, um, what the pros and cons are as far as transhumanism goes and this movement. Um, but I think as we're talking about WandaVision and we're talking about um, the motivation with what's happening there with vision and how it does actually really relate to what we see with transhumanism, um, as far as WandaVision goes, this alternate reality um, is created in an effort really to kind of escape reality and to avoid dealing with death and grief. Um, and it seems like there's a similarity there with transhumanism and, and uh, thinking about the hope that we're putting in, in transhumanism. Yeah, I mean, really, you know, people that are transhumanists are ultimately seeking after really the same thing that we as Christians would desire, which is a world without pain and suffering, a world where humanity flourishes, and ultimately the hope of eternal life. Unfortunately, transhumanists are placing their hope and trust in technology, whereas Christians were placing our hope and trust in the person of Christ. And unfortunately, you know, technology can never save us. It can improve the, the quality of our lives. It can promote human flourishing, but it can't truly save us. And in one real easy way to understand why that's the case is something called the salvation paradox. Because if we modify ourselves to such a degree that we no longer are humans, but we're post-humans, then that which we've actually saved isn't us anymore. It's what we've actually created. So that, that's the paradox, that's the irony of the transhumanist vision. So yeah, I think that's a very fascinating topic. So as we look at this technology um, that we see in WandaVision, um, but that we see also happening in, in real life, how can we view that with fairness and without fear from a Christian perspective? Well, I think it goes back to this idea that really science and technology are a gift that God has given to us. And it's these, these capabilities are designed for us to actually, uh, you know, fulfill the, the kingdom mandates, chief of which is to love our neighbor as ourself. And so these technologies that are fueling the transhumanist vision can actually be, be used for enormous amount of good in terms of, you know, the alleviating the pain and suffering caused by diseases and injury that are debilitating, spurring economic growth. So what we want to do as Christians is recognize that the benefit of these technologies, but also understand the risks and then be able to really articulate uh, a, a, a Christian worldview based cost benefit analysis with these technologies and help shape the direction our society goes with these technologies. Yeah, I hope that people will really dive into the content that you have provided because again, it's it's such a deep topic and we have a limited amount of time to talk about it here. So thank you so much Fuss, for, for joining us to talk about WandaVision and transhumanism. If you would like to check out more on this topic, go to reasons.org and search for Neuralink and also look for Humans 2.0 anywhere that you buy books. Hello, Jeff Zwerink, and welcome to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we look at important scientific ideas and how they help affirm the truth of the Christian faith. Today, we're joined again by uh, founder and president of Reasons to Believe, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we are going to explore the role that beetles play in developing flying robots. Hugh, it's good to have you here today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Jeff. Well, and we're going to be talking about beetles, and this is not the famous rock group. These are actually the bugs that crawl the earth. So, Beetles, in some sense, seem a little mundane. What is so special about them? Well, it's really special. They're the most diverse life form on the face of the earth. We're actually looking at a half million distinct species of beetles. Remarkable diversity of design. And what amazes me is how biologists are able to study these diverse beetle species and discover designs that we can apply to advance our modern technology. 
So, so what are some of the interesting features you see out of these beetles? Uh, you know, what, what makes them so diverse in their speciation? Well, I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, they're, you know, they have the armor plate. Some of them actually have an armor plate, which makes them very difficult to get, uh, get out of your house. Um, and they're able to feed on almost anything. Uh, but then you look at the wing structures and the way their feet are designed and their eye structures. And you see that each different species is designed to take advantage of a particular resource in their environment. So it sounds like there really are lots of different kinds of beetles. What beetles were these particular scientists investigating and what did they learn by studying them? Well, the rhinoceros beetles, uh, which are the biggest beetles we see in the natural realm. I mean, some of them get to be a half foot across. So we're talking, these are really big insects. And uh, you know, because they're so large, we can actually study their morphology in great detail. And this new research paper basically is a group of scientists that have done that very thing. What they notice is that these rhinoceros beetles, for example, have, have a nice armor plate that protects their delicate wing structure. And they're designed so that the armor plate can fold away, but the wings come up. And what amazes me is this beetle, as big and as heavy as it is, can actually fly quite efficiently. And so, you know, how it is that something that big and heavy uh, can fly the way it does. And what really amazed the researchers, this beetle is able to bump into things while it's flying and it doesn't really bother its trajectory. And it's like, wow, that's something we could really use uh, in, in our aircraft. None of our aircraft, for example, jet fighter aircraft, if they hit something, it's game over. And yet these beetles are able to bump into things and it doesn't bother them. That is really remarkable. And so if, so if I get what you're saying, there are these beetles that uh, three, four, five, six inches long that actually can fly. I mean, that, that's a kind of remarkable thing in and of itself. But so they, so they have an armor that plates over their body and this armor can actually kind of move away so that the wings extend. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. And so, so what is it that, I mean, do, does the armor plate just kind of pull the wings along or is there some more sophistication in how that works? Yeah, the armor plate folds back and lets these delicate wings, it's because the wings are so delicate that it's able to cause this heavy big beetle to fly. And so, yeah, that's one of the features of design. The wings have to be lightweight and delicate and therefore they need to be protected when they're moving along the ground. But yeah, it's designed so that the armor plate folds away, let the wings unfurl. But what these uh, people discovered, these researchers discovered uh, with uh, very uh, fast uh, moving cameras, uh, you know, cameras that actually take like 20,000 shots a second, they're able to discern that the reason why these incredibly delicate wings are able to bump into objects without being damaged, they're designed that every time they hit something, they basically fold up origami style and uh, therefore they're not damaged. And as soon as they get pa past the collision object, they immediately unfurl and they're back into their flying structure. And what amazed the researchers is how rapidly these wings can fold up when they bump into an object. And likewise, how rapidly they can unfurl again into a full flight structure. So it's only a split second uh, where this beetle doesn't have his wings in flight mode. And the, what they observed is, it doesn't even disturb the trajectory. They're able to maintain their flight pattern, their trajectory, in spite of bumping into not just one object, but multiple objects. So, so what are the implications of this research now that we have seen how these beetle wings actually work? Well, the researcher's paper ends with their description of them building a drone uh, where it's collision proof. And they basically demonstrated how this uh, flying drone uh, can bump into objects and the wing structure is undamaged and it can keep maintaining its trajectory. And basically they close their paper off by saying, there are times when we need to send a drone with high sensitivity cameras into an enclosed structure uh, where there's lots of objects in the different rooms and find, for example, a bomb uh, that's been planted there or some other dangerous item uh, maybe a gas canister. And so they said it'd be really helpful if we had flying drones that could go into a crowded building where there's all kinds of objects in the way 
and being able to have it to survey everything and basically determine, okay, what do we need to do to disarm the bomb or take care of this dangerous gas canister? Or even going into a place, for example, where gas fumes have been released and you need to find some critical medicine that a patient needs, or you need to rescue somebody uh, that's been uh, caught up in one of these situations. And uh, then they also said, you know, it'd be nice uh, for our military if they had fighter aircraft uh, where they could bump into objects and it still doesn't disturb the mission. And they said they actually think we, there's better chances of this technology being funded if we realize it's got military advantages. So, so you got this team of researchers that looked at these abundant species of beetles, chose one, found one, figured out how the wings worked, and now they're able to build things that are better than what we can, better than what we've been able to do. In other words, they've gained inspiration from doing this. Uh, that yeah. seems to have theological implications as well. Kind of address those, if you will. Well, they were able to copy the designs that they saw in these rhinoceros beetles. They're able to develop a drone uh, that is collision tolerant, but they also noted it doesn't work quite as well as a beetle. Uh, the beetle actually does it better. Uh, but the fact that we were able to copy this elegant design in a creature and come up with a useful instrument really tells us there's a creator out there that designed all the different species of life and built within them optimal designs. And isn't it great that we're able to copy those designs, maybe not do as well as a beetle, but get quite close. Thanks, Hugh. I appreciate your comments today. You're welcome. Yeah, as we look at creation, we just find remarkable forms of life that are out there. And, and I find it fascinating that as we go study these forms of life, we gain inspiration for how to build better designs. You know, it seems like there is, there's the apprentice and then there's the master. And if we, the apprentice, are looking at creation to get better inspiration for how to build better technology, it really does point to there being a designer behind it all. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and check out Hugh's blog on this very fascinating topic. It's Beetle Wing Design Inspires Flying Robot Construction helps you understand this fascinating discovery, as well as how you can use it to point others to the gospel of Christ. That does it for us this week on 2019. We hope you enjoyed this episode and that you'll consider binge watching all of WandaVision. Yeah, it's a pretty cool show. Um, we also hope that while you're binge watching that you will find us on social media. We're at 2819 show. We'd love to hear from you on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's right. Also, if you like the audio version in 2019, you can get us on most major podcast services. Just search Reasons to Believe Podcast. See you next week. Not sponsored by Disney+. Plus.